Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. We are so happy to have you here. Um, we arranged for it to rain today so that you wouldn't want to be in a state park instead, so we're really glad things um, complied with us. Um, this is our, one of our lunchtime lectures. We do lectures like this monthly. This week, we actually are having two lunchtime lectures. So on uh, Thursday, Marcus Redeker, an author of a new book on the Amistad, will be here speaking about um, his experiences in Sierra Leone, talking to people who heard about the Amistad from the captives who returned to Africa after being in Connecticut and the United States. Should be a great talk, and we're looking forward to that. But we're also really looking forward to today's talk, which promises to be wonderful. I have to say that on uh, Sunday, I spent a couple of hours riding up and down the state airline state park trail from Colchester to Lebanon. And the Sunday before that, my husband and one of our dogs climbed up to the vista at the top of Devil's Hop Yard, another great state park that I've enjoyed since I was a kid. And um, I think the week, well, every week we go to uh, Red Cedar Lake in Lebanon, which is also a state park. So we're big state park users, and I didn't even realize how much we use them until I started thinking about the program today. So we're really excited to have this program about parks in general. There's a lot of interesting information and a lot of things that are interesting to think about in terms of park, and we're going to do that today. Before we do that, um, I would like to introduce Diane Smith, who is the senior producer for program development at the Connecticut Network. As you know, if you come to our program, she moderates our programs and asks our panelists wonderful questions that really get the conversation going. And then she turns the questions and answers over to you so that you can ask the questions and make the comments that you would like to make. So I remind you to um, be part of the conversation as we get into the program. And before I have Diane come out, I would like to note that we are partnering on this program with Connecticut Explored, which is a wonderful Connecticut history magazine. This issue that I'm holding in my hand is available free in the back of the room, and it is all about parks. And so I think you will really enjoy reading that, particularly after the discussion today. And now I'd like to welcome Diane, who will introduce our guests. Hey everybody, um, I know this is gonna seem a little hard to remember um, at, on a day like today when it's in the 70s and rainy and kind of cool, but on July 4th this summer, as temperatures soared to near 100 degrees, remember that, that week of 100 degree weather? Residents flocked to the state parks. In fact, some parks reached capacity by mid-morning and actually had to shut their gates, they couldn't take anybody else. The number of visitors set a one-day all-time record. And I have to say that our parks are pretty popular. Eight million people a year visit the 107 state parks in Connecticut. And we have a small group of businessmen and naturalists to thank for their foresight in establishing our state park system 100 years ago. They recognized a need to preserve the state's special places before they were lost to development. This group, the State Park Commission, embarked on a statewide tour carefully selecting sites that represented Connecticut's heritage, its natural beauty, and its recreational potential. And they did a great job because today there is a state park within a 15 minute drive of just about every home in Connecticut. This summer is the beginning of a year-long centennial celebration to highlight the work of the founders of the state parks and to reconnect residents to the many beautiful places across our state that are the legacy of that first commission. Joining us today is Tom Tyler. He is the director of the State Parks and Public Outreach Division of the DEEP, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Since 1997, Tom has worked for each of the past six commissioners. He has represented the DEEP before the General Assembly on the department's wide range of issues. Tom's other duties for the DEEP have included leading the department's land acquisition and management program, as well as the Indian Affairs program. Please welcome Tom Tyler. Thank you, Diane, and uh, thank you to the old State House for welcoming us here today. Uh, we certainly look for any opportunity to talk about the State Park Centennial uh, and really appreciate everybody uh, coming out on such a, a rainy day, um, uh, but uh, certainly, certainly appreciate the, the opportunity. Um, so we're here to talk about the, the State Park Centennial. Uh, it was 100 years ago this year in 1913 where things really got, uh, really got rolling. 
Um, the uh, kind of setting, setting the stage a little bit, um, instead of jumping right into the individuals and, the, and their actions, to, to really just kind of get a sense of, of what Connecticut was like and some of the, some of the pressures uh, that led to the creation of the state park system. In some ways, the state was um, a blank slate, um, at least in terms of um, state parks. Obviously, there were um, a number of uh, important um, city parks at that point already and had been for, for many years, certainly including um, our important Bushnell Park here in, in Hartford. Um, but importantly, this is, I think, a, an interesting statistic here um, to uh, just look at the, the change in population right around that, that period, where from 1910 to 1913, uh, there was an over 7% uh, growth in, um, in population in the state of Connecticut. And just, just in terms of the, the economics of the time, um, you know, the, uh, obviously uh, the, the buying power back in the day was a lot different than it is today, just to kind of put that in, in context, talking about the, the value of first class postage being two cents and a loaf of bread cost six cents, just to put that in, in, in context a little bit. But also family life was, was a little different. Um, life expectancy for a woman back in those days was 55. For men, it was 50, and for those of us closing in on that um, that milestone, that becomes significant. Um, it, today, I guess the, the 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 general average is about 78. So it was certainly a, a, a much different um, uh, you know life for folks back then. Uh, I think another interesting element was that a lot of, to the extent folks had um, recreation and leisure um, opportunities, um, they really did harken back to the more rural. Um, aspects of, of, their, of, of their upbringing. Perhaps a picture in the upper right there is a, a carriage road um, in Bloomfield that uh, led to the, called the second Bartlett Tower at uh, Talcott Mountain uh, State Park, what is now Talcott Mountain State Park. Uh, but also at the time there was um, a, very, um, a very robust transportation system uh, for the masses. It was before people um, had privately owned cars for the most part, uh, but there was an incredibly extensive network of trolleys across the state, over a thousand miles of track and service compared to the 300 plus miles of interstate today, you really could get from pretty much anywhere from A to B in the state of Connecticut if you did a little planning and um, you, you, were, you wanted to get from Stonington to Winstead, you could do it. Probably might take you most of the day, and, uh, uh, but it was, it, it was possible to, to find your way um, around the state. Uh, it was also the era um, of the introduction of the income tax. It was only 1%. How bad could that be? Um, but but it, it, you had a sense that you know there certainly were were people of means, um, but uh, but uh, the, that that broad-based uh, tax structure um, just coming into play. But that is just a little bit of context for the the beginning of the state park commission. Um, in 1911 was really a, a, a moment uh, that that generated a lot lot of discussion. The Sem family in in Litchfield um, donated uh, property at the apex of what is now Mount Tom State Park and specifically in a will, uh, dedicated it to, uh, for state park use. Um, it was really something that the state needed to struggle with because there was no mechanism for the state to own and control state parks um, at that time. Uh, so they did the expeditious thing at the time and handed the property to state, the existing, then existing State Forest Commission uh, to manage the property until um, things could be, uh, could be squared away. But it did, it did generate um, a conversation and, and, and contributed to a conversation that was ongoing. Um, both across the country and certainly here in Connecticut about the idea of state parks and creating these natural spaces for, uh, for our citizens. Um, and, and in 1911, uh, Governor Baldwin created a, a temporary, a group called the State Park Commission, but they were really a temporary task force uh, that was created to really study the issue of the feasibility of creating a permanent state park commission. Um, uh, and so in, in 1913, they, they, the temporary commission finished their work um, and it's, a, it's actually a very interesting read for folks who want to uh, uh, take a look at, uh, at, at, the, at some of the arguments and um, ideas behind the, the, the push to create a permanent state park commission, but they made that recommendation to the General Assembly in 1913. Um, that it, it, the legislation did pass that spring, and it uh, directed the governor to appoint six persons who will constitute a board to be known as a state park commission, and that they would uh, begin, to, begin to do their work in September of 1913. Um, September 29th, they held their first meeting um, in room 13 of the, what was then the New Haven County Courthouse. It's now uh, New Haven uh, uh, City Hall. The building is uh, still there. It's got a big skyscraper right behind it right now, but uh, uh, the, the facade is still there. Um, so the, the governor uh, went about um, designating the, the, the first six members. Uh, they first called on um, uh, General Edward Bradley was, was voted as the initial chair. He also served on the temporary task force, a real uh, driver 
um, behind the initial group. And then joining him from left to right, as you can see their names there, John Calhoun, John Fox, E.H. Uh, e. Wilkins, Lucius Robinson, and H.H. H. Chapman. Um, <clears throat> all of them, you know, um, important individuals, um, for the most part wealthy, uh, connected individuals in their own right, just as one. Uh, Lucius Robinson, for folks who are familiar with the Robinson Cole Law Firm here in Hartford, uh, Lucius Robinson was a, a member of that firm and the nephew of the original founder, who was also Lucius Robinson. Um, the governor chose well um, in these individuals, the little stars representing where they came from across the state, looking for um, you know, uh, geographic representation across the state to take into account the various uh, needs of, of different citizens, but uh, wanting to make sure folks uh, understood that the, that the state was well represented in this new commission. So they, they came together in September of 13. Uh, obviously, they were very anxious to get about the work of acquiring property, but they recognized that um, really they need to go, needed to go about this in a, in a managed way. They really needed a review of the possibilities, um, and that they recognized that the first need was to bring on, this is their notes from their, from their meeting, enable an experienced civil engineer to act as the field secretary. So they went about that as really their first task of bringing on board the first staff person to help, help them do that. Um, and they did accomplish that by bringing on board um, this gentleman, Albert Turner, who um, the more we look at the history, we become convinced he really is just such an important mover um, in the, the early years uh, and until this day. Um, of the, the state park system. He served, with the, um, he served with the Park Commission for 28 years uh, before his retirement. Um, he was uh, a native of, of Litchfield, Yale-educated civil engineer, had a, a number of other jobs in the, he was uh, with an engineering firm in New Haven laying out trolley lines and things like that before he came to the, to the State Park Commission. Uh, but he went about, he started his work really immediately. Um, one of the overriding quests of his, of his work really was to um, to, to, to quench the, the really the nearly universal desire to be near water. Uh, the, commissioner, the commissioners and Mr. Turner certainly recognized an important piece of that was saltwater frontage along Long Island Sound. Um, so Mr. Turner, it's not entirely clear from the notes exactly physically how he did this by walking or car or trolley, probably a combination of all three of those. Uh, he traversed the entire 254 mile coastline of Connecticut personally. Uh, taking photos along the way, developing lists of priorities, his three highest priorities ultimately being uh, Bluff Point, Hammonasset Beach, and Sherwood Island, which we know as um, state parks uh, today. This is one of Mr. Turner's photographs from uh, uh, 1914 at the uh, Sherwood Farm at uh, Sherwood Island in Westport. Um, he also recognized uh, that for citizens in the northern tier of the state, their access to waterfront property was more along, was going to be was going to be along a lake. Um, so he focused on every lake in the state of Connecticut over 40 acres. Um, he looked at uh, every one of those bodies of water, uh, culled that list down, um, excluding um, drinking water reservoirs, um, lakes that had periodic drawdowns that would affect their recreational value, culled that down to 56, visited every one of those, excuse me, 57, visited every one of those um, bodies of water and ultimately recommended 18. Again, looking, continuing a major focus on water locations, looking at the, the major uh, lower river corridors um, in Connecticut, certainly the, uh, the Connecticut River. Uh, these were his notes that it provided numerous opportunities, exist below Middletown. The Thames was beautiful, but with advanced development. The Housatonic had charming possibilities, and the Naugatuck at the time, and for many years after, was, in his words, a disgrace to our civilization. Obviously, it has come a long, long way, and it is just a beautiful river corridor today after um, many, many changes in, in policy and investments by the public. Um, so when, once these, once, once these uh, priorities were put in place, they really could, they really could get to work. Um, so they saw their next task is just moving forward with the acquisitions. But um, with the original act that was, uh, that was created, um, there was uh, $20,000 um, made available um, to the commission for their work. You can see that a waterfront buildable um, um, buildable acre of land was 6,500 along the shoreline. That money wouldn't have, have gone very far. So part of their initial task was working uh, with the General Assembly to uh, put in place funds to, to, move, the, uh, to move the project uh, forward, recognizing that uh, the shorefront property was already expensive and escalating quickly, and they needed to, they needed to move quickly. Um, so they, they, their, their first acquisition, their first focus was on um, a Long Island Sound shorefront at Sherwood Island, what's now Sherwood Island State Park. 
Um, there was a very small piece of property, a five-acre parcel that they went to a public auction and acquired. Um, it, was, um, uh, it was the beginning of a very long struggle and, and, a, and a piece of property where there was a lot of lessons learned. I think one of the difficulties of trying to condense this history down into a 20-minute presentation is you, you, you lose some of the stories, and, and this is one I'll just, I'll just touch on, but please understand that you know, really each of these parks have their own unique stories and partners that helped bring them to, uh, to fruition. Uh, but so they purchased their first five acres in, in December of 1914, and then very quickly thereafter, actually just a week later, um, uh, filed um, the papers uh, to acquire uh, almost 550 acres in East Haddam as Heard State Park. Uh, but just getting back to uh, the underlying picture there, that, 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 uh, so this property, this first five acres, which is where the tents are and a little bit to the, uh, to the right um, leading into the, the salt marsh in, in Sherwood Island, um, the, the, this is the commissioners in the foreground in a uh, field meeting on uh, 1923, um, looking at what was actually illegal camping happening at the, at the state park um, at the time. Uh, the acquisition in 1914 in Sherwood Island really be began a decades-long struggle to really secure enough property um, in Westport at Sherwood Island to welcome the public. So this was 10 years after the first acquisition that was, the, that was the extent of the state's uh, recreation opportunity at Sherwood Island State Park. But again, a lot of lessons learned there by the, by the commissioners that would uh, uh, come into play um, in, in later years. Um, but all, all of the acquisitions weren't terribly expensive or um, it, there, there was a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, inland locations, particularly mountaintops, upland brooks, uh, some of the, value, the land values there were lesser. Obviously, uh, you know, a mountaintop is probably not appropriate for agriculture. If it's already been logged, it's lost a lot of its um, economic value. So an awful lot of, of, of other properties were purchased around the state um, at, at much more affordable, um, affordable costs. Um, one of the, the interesting pieces about the early years, you know, operating a state park system is acquiring the property and running the parks for the public. In the early years, they, they had the, the breathing room, if you will, by, by not being crushed with too many visitors. Um, the, 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 the First World War was on, um, and, and, and so they had an opportunity to acquire land, but things were changing there. Coincidentally, also in 1913 was the, the year Henry Ford incorporated an assembly line into uh, his operation, and, and you know, private ownership of, of vehicles was, uh, was becoming uh, a much more common thing, and the existence of the trolley lines um, created, that, uh, uh, created that opportunity. I don't mess this up. Um, so with that came the increasing need for um, to um, dedicate some resources to the motoring public, and, and really the Wayside Park was the way uh, to do that. This is Warden Brooks State Park on the Wallingford um, <clears throat> North Haven line. Um, it was a facility where you could come and you could, you could get gas, you could eat, you could camp free for one night. Um, it's obviously a much different facility today. That building in the middle still exists, but the rest of it doesn't, and it's now a very forested piece of property with a, a great um, swimming lake that was created um, in the 50s. Um, just another kind of the same shot. I just love this picture. You can see the, uh, the photographer in the foreground. I just think it's a, uh, that's a great picture. We bust that out anytime we get a chance. Um, but so, one of the, so at the time also, particularly with Albert Turner, frustration was growing. Inland things were happening, but there was um, very little movement along the shoreline. And um, when it came to a meeting in um, December of 1918, really five years in, it was a time to, to reassess. Uh, and Albert Turner, in his very well-spoken, elegant, and eloquent way of speaking and writing, made a very passioned, uh, impassioned uh, presentation to the commission, um, really challenging them to work with him to step up their efforts um, along the shoreline. The greatest need for action continues to be along the shore. Um, so, uh, the, with, with his comments, the, the, the commission, who was, was just um, um, always very supportive of, of Mr. Turner, really regrouped, uh, pursuing funds, um, and looking to assist him with moving forward uh, with this goal of creating a shoreline park. Uh, Turner knew the danger there was, if you actually created one of these things, folks might really come. Uh, they were designing it for uh, 20,000 visitors a day. Uh, recognizing that to provide for the comfort and well-being of, of such numbers of people would be incredible challenges. Uh, so in December of 18, um, they had that very pointed discussion on the board, um, and maybe to contrast it a little bit to the very slow advance of, of Sherwood Island, um, in the next um, 18 months, uh, 19 months, excuse me, 
Um, in the 19 months after that meeting, um, nearly a half a million dollars was appropriated by the General Assembly. Uh, land totaling nearly 500 acres was purchased in, in Madison. Plans for a 300 foot long pavilion were drawn up and construction completed, as well as the infrastructure of sewer, water, electricity, and the gates were open at Hammond Acid Beach State Park in 19 months. Um, just, just an amazing, an amazing feat. Some interesting pictures there of the, uh, um, of the construction underway. Um, and it was met with immediate success. People came by the thousands immediately uh, to Hammond Acid in the first year. Um, some even went in the water, uh, but uh, uh, it was this large pavilion called the Clam Shed, and as well as other, other pavilion buildings were created. Um, and um, it created create the, the opportunity for people to get out of the sun. There was uh, food was provided. Uh, there's an opportunity for food to be provided as well as the, uh, the shoreline beach. Um, and attendance at parks then skyrocketed to the then high number of a million annual visitors. Uh, but that acquisition in, um, in right around 1920 um, really did set the tone for the next decade. The, 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 the next, the, the next um, 10 or so years, there was just tremendous growth um, in the park system, acquisitions across the state, acquisitions, I keep saying acquisitions, but acquisitions, donations, um, as well as um, every state park, so the, the acquisition mechanism is, is different um, in every case with a lot, of, uh, a lot of important partners. Just a couple of examples, uh, the 940 acres of Houstonic Meadows and Sharon um, and the incredibly important Sleeping Giant, the work of the Sleeping Giant Association um, and the almost 900 acres of the, the Sleeping Giant. There's a, an old picture there. You can see the, uh, the coring along the head of the, the giant on the left, which was the, uh, the impetus for so many people um, to, to, to look to preserve that property. Um, certainly, uh, lean times then came after the crash in 1929. Uh, while the value of property decreased significantly, it created a little bit of window for the commission as property prices decreased precipitously. They had a little bit of money left over from the prior years. Uh, they moved through that, so they had, a, they had some successful acquisitions there. Uh, but the money did uh, begin to, certainly did begin to, to dry up. But, but one really great highlight um, was the acquisition um, in 1931 of the almost 600 acres of uh, Rocky Neck, what became Rocky Neck State Park. Uh, it was an old, it was the Niantic Fish Oil and Guano Company. Um, it was a really a fish processing um, facility that was just the bane of the, and there were lawsuits, everybody was trying to shut this thing down for years. There were a couple of suspicious fires in this building. Um, but ultimately the state, uh, with the assistance of uh, a number of wealthy individuals who helped purchase the property to hold it until the state's money could be put in place, including a number of members of the board of the Forest and Park Association, um, were, were really critical to bridge the, uh, the, the funding of that. Um, it's just amazing to me when they, when they first bought the property, they made it available to the public in the building that was used as the, the fish factory. If you read that carefully, it says Rocky Neck State Park on the side of it. And if you look really closely, uh, one of those doors says bathhouses and another one says refreshments. Um, but uh, so that was uh, uh, a great, important acquisition. But it also coincided with the um, very significant um, you know, reduction in, in fundings available uh, to the state to run uh, the state park system. Um, in, in the introduction of the, um, um, the Work Progress Administration, the CCCs, um, the, and camps across the state. Um, they, they assisted just around the state with the creation of roads and bridges and campgrounds, and, and certainly the, not the least of which was ultimately the, the construction of the Ellie Mitchell Pavilion at Hammond Asset, which was designed to be just a little bit longer than the, than the um, pavilion at, at Hammond Asset, and is just a beautiful facility that uh, is certainly there for the public uh, to enjoy today. I know I'm getting short on time, so I'm going to talk even faster. You guys have to listen even faster. Um, so the CCCs really were an important era um, in the state parks, uh, in the state parks and forests in terms of projects getting done. There were 23 camps um, across the state. Uh, there's some great artwork. Uh, apparently, there was starving artists were uh, um, were also employed in the CCC program. Um, impressionist artist uh, Harry Leith Roth captured a number of uh, great images for us of the CCC person people um, across the state doing a lot of great projects. Um, staycations aren't a new thing, certainly during the Depression. Um, people did stay relatively close to home. Uh, the, the campgrounds at Rocky Neck and Hammond Asset um, began to fill quickly. There used to be over a thousand campsites at, at Hammond Asset that were routinely filled all summer long. Uh, we reached a, an annual attendance of, of two million uh, visitors at that point. Uh, but then again, with, the, uh, with uh, gasoline restrictions, um, and by the beginning of World War II, where some of the parks, particularly Hammond Asset, were transferred to the military department uh, during the war years, uh, attendance uh, did decline. 
Um, again, kind of moving quickly through history here, but uh, uh, at, the, at the end of World War II, with people, again, with more disposable income and more uh, recreation time, uh, things that we know today as, as, as more um, you know, mainstream recreational pursuits, camping, hiking, fishing, birding, et cetera, really came into the fore, and state parks really provided uh, those opportunities for folks. Um, organizationally, um, things have changed. Uh, there was a standalone state park commission for a number of years that was ultimately merged into the State Park and Forest Commission. In the, in the 1970s, management of parks and forests came under the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. And as Diane was saying, we are now the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, of which uh, state parks operations is a part. Uh, an important juncture in the history um, of, of our parks, more, more recent and, and just important in, in, in a growing way, um, is the involvement of advocacy groups and, and local, uh, local groups. Uh, we generally call them our friends groups. Uh, there are now 24 uh, friends groups across the state for individual state parks, as well as the umbrella organization of the Friends of Connecticut State Parks. We could not do what we do, and our individual park supervisors at their parks could not do what they do without the, the assistance of, of all of these great groups from volunteer labor to financial support for projects that the state can't fund. Uh, it's just, just um, immeasurable support. Um, what's also changed over, over time is, is programming. We were talking earlier about uh, uh, you know, programming at parks, um, you know, the, the opportunity for um, environmental education um, and kind of tying in with our friends. Uh, uh, the, the nature centers at Sherwood Island and Meg's Point really couldn't either exist or run without the support that we get from the, the friends of Sherwood Island and the friends of Hammonasset Beach State Park. So we are, at, we are at 100 years. As Diane was saying, there, is, uh, there, there, was, there was a goal that was achieved to have a state park um, or forest recreation area within uh, 15 minutes of um, every resident of the state of Connecticut. Uh, the yellow is showing the, the, the current locations of our 107 state parks, uh, over 32,000 acres. Uh, we also have uh, uh, under management the uh, over 200,000 acres of state, por state forests and the forest recreation areas. Um, uh, but again, within, uh, within a 15 minute drive of everybody. So let me wrap up there. I just wanted to you know, encourage people to um, maybe learn some more. We have a, a great website um, launching or a, that's launched with a, a bunch of different things to, for folks to look at, including um, kind of history. We've got uh, 365 fun facts of the day of you know, this day in state park history. Uh, if you go on the, the state park page and uh, uh, check that out, it has a, also a bunch of information about the events that we have coming uh, during the year. This week we're kicking off what we're calling the Summer Sojourn, uh, which is a, um, an event where folks will be uh, traversing 160 miles, <clears throat> 169 miles from Quadic State Park in the northeast corner of Connecticut all the way down to Sherwood Island in Westport over about a 10-day period. You'll be seeing and hearing more about that over the next uh, couple of weeks. We're pretty excited about that. Obviously, we've got things like our, our banners up to, uh, to help highlight it. Uh, an important, uh, we're very excited about uh, camping cabins. We're adding, uh, as part of the State Park Centennial, we're adding 100 uh, camping cabins um, across the, uh, the State Park system. And for th those of you who uh, uh, like your technology, we've got a really cool new State Park app, that middle icon there. It's a, a free download for anybody who's got a, a, an iPhone or a, an Android, uh, providing just tremendous amounts of information, both about the Centennial, but also about the, uh, the State Parks um, generally. So I think I'm over my time a little bit. Um, so let me, let me wrap it up there, and we'll, I'll turn it back to Diane. Thank you. Jean, Mary, come on up. Uh, Tom, I just wanted to double check one fact with you. Did you say that Rocky Hill, the building that was purchased, was a fish oil and guano company? Yes, they, um, they uh, I think it was. Do you know what a guano company is? <laughs> yeah, so they, uh, I believe it was Manhattan fish that they, um, that they would harvest, and then there were these big conveyors that moved it up into that building you saw, and they would steam the oil out of the fish and then uh, process the fish for, um, for fertilizer. Uh, Can't imagine why people wanted that out of their neighborhood. Yep. It sounds lovely. Uh, joining us now on the panel are Jean Leach, who is a professor of history and American studies emeritus at Trinity College, where he continues to teach from time to time in an adjunct role. He's vice president of the Association for the Study of Connecticut History, a member of the editorial team and board of Connecticut Explored, and a member of the editorial board of Connecticut History. And Mary Rickle Pelletier is chair of the Hartford Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission, 
and founding director of Park Watershed Incorporated, which is a citizen stewardship organization for the Park River Regional Watershed that flows through the city of Hartford and into the Connecticut River. And uh, Mary, I wanted to start with that. Um, you mentioned that Hartford City Parks are important links to state parks. Let's talk about how so. Well, the city parks, uh, not just in Hartford, but all across the state, are places where the smaller scale neighborhood sized friends group are working and a lot of times they see the connections they want to make a connection say from philly pond park in bloomfield up to pembroke park mm -hmm. and uh, they'll work with their uh, their municipal staff uh, to make those connections across private lands or open space and so um, that's an example of the relationship of municipal parks to state parks mm -hmm. and of course the state parks they also connect to some of our, uh, what in, in the Hartford areas, the, the Silvio Conti Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuge, and the National Blue Way. Mm -hmm. Tom, would you talk a little bit about that National Wildlife Refuge? Yeah, no, it's a tremendous resource for, for folks' um, acquisitions along the, the Connecticut River, and I, I know the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service folks and, and others are, are, are looking to do more there, but it's a great opportunity for um, both local and state and federal cooperation to figure out the best mechanisms to, um, to acquire those, you know, uh, and, and provide for, you know, public ownership mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of some of those really important resources, you know, particularly along the, uh, the Connecticut River Valley. Um, Tommy did such a nice job of showing us the beginnings of the parks um, that I wanted to ask all three of you really about what people were looking for in a park 100 years ago <clears throat> versus what they're looking for today. And Gene, you're the, you're the history mm -hmm. professor. Um, people wanted to gather in parks, but what did they want at that time? A uh, great many things, uh, most of them amounting to relief from or contrast to industrial civilization. Uh, they wanted to restore their connections to nature. Uh, they, they wanted literally peace and quiet. They wanted beauty, uh, all, all, all things that were thought uh, to, be, to be lacking mm -hmm. in uh, often uh, very rapidly developing and ill-managed industrial cities, uh, even here in Connecticut, where I think conditions were probably better than they were in Chicago or some other parts of the country. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I'm fascinated, and I'm not sure very much is known about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, c the connections between city parks and state parks. Mm -hmm. uh, city parks, of course, predate state parks. Mm -hmm. uh, state parks were celebrating the, the centennial uh, but city parks, of course, go back to Bushnell Park, which is what, about a mile and a half from here, even mm -hmm. less than that, uh, from the 1850s, yeah. uh, predating even Central Park in New York. And there is a, a, a quite impressive uh, urban or municipal park system here in Hartford mm -hmm. managed by Francis Goodwin. Uh, all of this in the, in the 1890s, a uh, good 20 years before the state, state parks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know wh whether that uh, prior effort within the cities to reserve stretches of nature and, and uh, cultivate stretches of nature uh, for the benefit of stressed urban dwellers. I don't know whether that plays into the development of the state parks, but I suspect it did have a role. Mm -hmm. uh, the initiatives taken in the cities uh, were other kinds of precedents uh, for the initiatives finally taken by the state. Starting, starting in 1913. Tom, you're nodding about that. Yes, absolutely. And it's and, and again, I, one of the, one of the difficulties of trying to compress the history that there certainly was, you know, uh, around the formation of the the early years of the state park system. Certainly, um, you know, a, a, a universe of folks, many of which involved in in, in city parks uh, that were part of this. Uh, uh, notes from a, a meeting in uh, handwritten notes from a meeting in 1911 titled the first agitation meeting. Um, but it was, it was a represent, number of representatives from the um, Hartford Park system were, uh, were, were, were certainly drivers behind that. Mary, what were people looking for in city parks uh, back in, at that time in the 1850s or up until uh, the time that Tom references, which is 100 years ago, versus what they want today when they go there? I would say in some respects they were looking for everything then, they were looking for everything now, and they're looking for it for free. <laughs> and But beauty, I think, is a very important part of it. And the, the fact that the, that uh, Bushnell Park was created in, in 1853 from an industrial site and in order to make a part of the city more beautiful, more healthy, um, more respectable. Uh, that, that's a huge aspiration for all of our parks, for all landscapes today. So. Uh, what do they want today? I, I think there's a, there's 
plenty of people who still look to nature for a, uh, that that scenic, beautiful quality. There are still there are also a lot of people who are looking for economic issues, they they or recreational issues, and uh, and they aren't exactly always aligned. Mm -hmm. So we we balance those out with the the state park system and the state forest system. We see how they're balancing that out, and in in our city park systems, you know, how do we pools and and playing fields, how do we balance that out with great meadows and and uh, the landscapes, just these beautiful landscapes. So you're saying there are pressures um, from residents to say, I want to be able to go to a park and I want to be able to take my kids and swim, or we want to be able to have ball fields that they can play on, or basketball courts or whatever, versus the pure ecological part of having just a beautiful open space, whether it's a meadow or whether it's a, a garden. Exactly. And Olmsted, I have to say, wasn't necessarily, he, I mean, he didn't want uh, a racetrack in Central Park. So mm -hmm. he, was, he was actually rather adverse to some of the recreational activities. The core of the parks were, and I'm sure Jean can help me with this, or really about uh, sort of um, communing with nature, sort of connecting, connecting with the natural world. So it's very hard to protect that uh, in our, our current uh, uh, environmental and economic situation, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the city where there's a lot of development pressures and people see open space and say, we could put something there right down the middle. You know, right in the middle would be perfect. And, and yet, in many respects, people move to the suburbs or they're, they're moving to seek that natural beauty and, and yet we have it, we, ha we can have it right in, in the center of our city as, mm -hmm. as Olmsted and Bushnell showed us. Um, Jean, I'm thinking about um, a park that you called scandalous, uh, that was a, an unusual park that was in Hartford, and yet there were several parks similar to it in other parts of the state. And I note uh, uh, the park we're talking about is Luna Park, and I'm thinking about Bridgeport had Pleasure Beach, West Haven had Savin Rock. Um, tell us a little bit about Luna Park. Well, if you want the real story, uh, you ought to be subscribers to Connecticut Explored, uh, free copies of which are available in the back. Uh, and unfree copies are available by simply applying to us and giving us money. Uh, but uh, uh, a, an article on Luna Park appears in the, the, uh, the latest uh, issue, and uh, it's uh, to shorten the story, it was an amusement park uh, which uh, lived for four years uh, in West Hartford uh, along New Park Avenue, uh, roughly where Home Depot is now. Uh, it was built on a section of land that had, had already been developed uh, uh, and used as a, as a harness racing, racing tra track. Uh, all, all of this part of 19th century Hartford. Uh, Luna is uh, built very quickly on the model of Coney Island amusement parks, uh, which had begun in 1897. Uh, Luna is built in 1906. Uh, it has a very checkered history and a very short history because it, it proves to be a financial failure so that it, it is already gone essentially by 1910. Uh, but uh, while it lasted, it was uh, a very exciting initiative and, and uh, a sort of an unexpected initiative for a famously first puritanical but then Victorian <laughs> town, which is what uh, Hartford, Hartford, really? Hartford, Hartford had been and, and which is why uh, Mark Twain came here. He came here uh, to cover over his wild oats, uh, not, 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 not to sow them. <laughs> Uh, and, yet, uh, and yet Luna Park was, was uh, very much for sowing wild oats. And so it was always controversial, and I think uh, its controversial nature, the fact that it was not respectable, it was not like other parks. In other words, it was an amusement park. Which well, what were in, some in, of its in, amusements? In, in, in the minds of, of uh, the people who developed the state parks, and certainly Bushnell, an amusement park is a sort of an anti-park. Uh, but uh, it has a roller coaster, it has a circle swing, which uh, uh, I describe in the, in the article as a giant centrifuge for, for human beings, <laughs> twirling people above, above the ground. Uh, it has a Ferris wheel. It has uh, carnival uh, events of all kinds. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's all over the place, uh, constantly reinventing itself uh, in an effort to attract customers, especially customers with more than a few nickels. Uh, in other words, respectable middle class, even middle-aged customers. And that it has trouble, trouble doing. I mean, it, it, it is always uh, associated with its, uh, its harness racing track 
uh, neighbor and history, and uh, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that uh, it does not succeed, whereas the, just a few years later, the state park system gets going, mm -hmm. and of course the rest of the, the real parks in Hartford uh, just g grow and thrive from mm -hmm. that point on. With this, because the Luna Park really emerged from, as you pointed out, the Columbia World's Fair, the World's Fair in Chicago, in 1892, which was a lot about innovation. There was, mm -hmm. and and I, I I wonder if these sort of Luna Parks, again, I I don't believe they belong on parkland, but they they belong near parkland. They they they're kind of a hinge between innovation, creativity, and exploration, right? And and then and then that landscape that 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 does. That is that is open and and uh, full of possibilities, mm -hmm. right? And and so, I, I mean, I see places for uh, the Luna Parks uh, near our our beautiful landscapes that they they have a they have a great uh, symbiotic relationship because they they they're places of exploration, but but not on mm -hmm. on the historic landscape. And it seemed to me that there were a number of uh, similar parks that were built by the trolley companies just to have a place for people to ride the trolley to. So they'd go to the end of the line and then there'd be an amusement park at the very end of the line, but it would get people to get on board and pay a fare on a day when they didn't have to pay a fare to go to work. So it was partly a way to raise funds for the trolley companies. Uh, that actually was not part of the Luna story. Uh, uh, Luna was built by a New Haven construction company and one of the big issues about Luna was access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was inadequate trolley service. Mm -hmm. And much of the early reporting about Luna complains about the puny uh, trolley uh, service uh, from, from downtown Hartford, uh -huh. where most of the people were, were, were coming from. Uh, but yeah, there, there's, there's a park called Mountain Park uh, in Holyoke, uh, which was built uh, even before Luna, but without, without a, a, uh, uh, big big rides like roller coasters. Uh, and that, that was a true trolley park. It was built in order to uh, increase ridership on the trolley mm -hmm. uh, to, get, to create a destination for, for a trolley usage. Yeah. But I have to say that you know, Mary's characterization of an amusement park as an appropriate uh, accessory or neighbor uh, of a state park, Home, uh, Olmstead, and I'm delighted you cited Olmstead. Uh, uh, Olmstead would have hated that. Frederick Law Olmstead from Hartford is really truly one of the great figures of the 19th century in this country, uh, an incredibly creative character uh, who creates parks around the country. Mm -hmm. He's a landscape architect, but he's also a park designer. And any discussion of parks should certainly uh, mention Olmsted several, several times. Mm -hmm. uh, but Olmsted uh, uh, certainly would have hated Luna uh, and wouldn't have wanted it, uh, Luna anywhere near his, his <laughs> parks. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, really did think of parks, as I think most people continue to do, as sites for uplifting amusement. Uh, and maybe not amusement at all, but for uplift, uh, for improvement, for education. Parks were almost like churches or schools. Uh, they were not like saloons, dance halls, and theaters. And that was the category in which amuse amusement parks belonged. Mm -hmm. There's a real, real opposition there. Mm -hmm. That's the tension, I think, that we you knew. Yeah, we saw that certainly in the, the early years of the state park system of really understanding what, what were people looking for, how, mm -hmm. do you, how, do you, how do you meet those needs, and it's certainly something that uh, even Albert Turner struggled with. I'm trying to remember his quote, but he talked about you know, trying to envision what people want and then in the next 30 years and the next 30 years mm -hmm. and the next 30 years, and you can see that where, you know, in, the, in the early years there was um, you know, folks were looking to come to the shore. The understanding was they, you know, you needed to build build infrastructure for them. They needed to, they wanted to be out of the sun and have food, and uh, the infrastructure needed to be built. But not too many years later, um, Lake Warmog State Park was was developed up in Washington, a beautiful facility. If you've been up there, it's a quiet, idyllic spot on a beautiful lake with a great campground, very popular spot. Uh, but there's very little infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. But when the, when the state first acquired it, uh, there's old photographs of this huge, huge structure they built. You can't even quite picture where it was on the property, mm -hmm. uh, but just thousands of square feet structure because they thought that's what they needed to do to attract mm -hmm. folks. And mm -hmm. um, you know, again, tastes change over time and, mm -hmm. and what folks are, are looking for and the, the, the state park system and really all park systems have had to um, react to that. and. Um, provide what people are looking for. Interesting. So if you were to be building that park today or acquiring that land today, you wouldn't put up the same kind of structure that it once had. That's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. our, our, our newest acquisitions um, uh, to the state park system, uh, there is very limited infrastructure mm -hmm. generally um, mm -hmm. going in.
Um, you mentioned, and, and Mary mentioned to me beforehand, the role of Friends of Parks. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to mention, because one of our um, friends in the audience is from the Connecticut Far uh, Forest and Parks Association, mm -hmm. I don't know how we would maintain mm -hmm. hiking trails across the state without them. And, and if you want to make a comment, we'll bring a mic over to, uh, to say a word or two. Yeah, we, um, the state parks and the whole movement, it was not only state driven, but really individually driven. Tom had talked about the number of wealthy individuals who uh, went out and secured properties like uh, Gillette, et cetera, um, and then convinced the state to do the right thing in order to buy uh, the property. Um, that needs to continue today. What the Friends do, and the Friends actually share space with us at CFBA, um, what they do is they're really the voice for the state parks, and it really is a needed voice because as, as wonderful as the system is, and as much revenue as it generates, in uh, 2010, the Yukon did a program, uh, a study in which they showed that it gener state parks generate about a billion dollars worth of economic activity. Not enough of that economic revenue is being put back into the state parks. Mm -hmm. Tom and the group at uh, DEP just do a tremendous job, tremendous job with, uh, even though they're really underfunded at this stage. So individuals reaching out and talking to legislators and supporting groups like the Friends is really important. Mm -hmm. So thank you for mentioning that. We'd like to open it up to questions. If anybody has any, please uh, raise your hand and we'll bring you a microphone. Yeah. Um, Mary, you might respond on this. Hartford has its own scandal with parks, Batterson Park. That should be a state park, should be a regional park. Probably the most underused park in the state. And years ago, it was used by a lot of people. It sits there empty every night of the week. It's only open on weekends, and it's very unused, and it's in a beautiful position. What, what would you think? Should the state take it over? Should it be regional? Should the city spend more money 15 miles away from the city? What do you think, Mary? Well, that's, a, that's a great question uh, uh, because it, uh, right now, Farmington, uh, the town of Farmington has put... Uh, request that there be land de developed uh, in Deadwood Swamp, uh, which is the, the Batterson and Deadwood Swamp are the headwaters of the north of the south branch of the Park River mm -hmm. uh, and Trout Brook. And so, and, and Batterson is impaired with the water quality, so there's a lot of water quality issues because of the development around there. It hasn't been coordinated. And it's true because it's a Hartford Park outside of, of Hartford, uh, it's really been un, um, it's unmanaged. It needs a friends group. And it, I'm not sure it can be a state park because of the limited resources the state has right now. Um, and the bass fish, fishermen, fishermen like to use it because there's not motorboats, but then there's an effort to bring motorboats back because uh, they bring some revenue, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's so many issues around Batterson, and it might be an opportunity for a new type of model. Uh, again, it needs a friends group. It needs some funding in order to work out these questions, because the questions depend upon the neighbors around it and the responsible entities, and, and frankly, the downstream uh, uh, areas of Batterson where that water is going to flow. And I don't know, how, could you acquire a, a Batterson as yeah, a state park? Yeah, I think the, the issue of ownership, you know, it's certainly an issue of resources, but I think the, the issue of ownership is a little less important than really about public access and, and what, what can really we do. And I, I don't know a lot about Batterson Park, but I am familiar with one recent issue. You, you touched on it with uh, um, access to the public for, for fishing and, and motorized uh, uh, boat fishing. And, and I know our, our fishery staff, that's, that's really been a, um, you know, an issue for a number of years of such a great resource being so close uh, to so many people, uh, being really uh, not terribly uh, available to people. That we've been so pleased with the, the work of the city and the, uh, the, the city parks to, to work with our folks to, to bring that additional public access, which will be, uh, if it doesn't already exist, will be coming soon to, to Batterson. So that's a, it's a, that'll be a great resource for folks in the, in the greater Hartford area. I think I saw a question over here. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah. You have a question over here. OK. Greetings to the panel. Professor Leach, how are you? Uh, my question relates to any influence that Robert Moses may have had 
in the course of working with state parks. Because again, he's coming into power in the 1920s, mm -hmm. wondering if he may have had any influence or been influenced by mm -hmm. anything being done in the state of Connecticut. I particularly am interested in your question because I grew up in the state of New York. And um, all the beaches that we went to were, you know, the result of uh, Robert Moses' uh, great leadership on that. So that means a lot to me, in fact. Yeah, to be honest with you, uh, we, we've done an awful lot of, of, of research through, um, you know, really significant uh, files. Uh, you know, while, uh, while his work was contemporaneous with the, the growth of the state park system, um, I, know, I know at the time, even back then, there were um, a number of national conferences on state parks and, and, and the creation of parks. Um, I'm sure folks were influenced by each other, but I, 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 we haven't seen that in really a concrete way with, with references back and forth. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure somebody of that magnitude was you know, mm -hmm. creating, the, creating the areas that he did down on Long Island and across New York um, was, was certainly uh, an influence and vice versa, but I, we don't have any really specific reference to that. A question over here. By coincidence, I was down to uh, Harkness yesterday, uh, what an absolutely beautiful facility, or actually it was Sunday, what a beautiful facility that is. But I also wanted to comment that next door there is an absolutely beautiful park for the disabled that is, that is uh, connected with the Harkness or right next door to the Harkness. So I wanted to thank the uh, state of Connecticut and the people of Connecticut for that facility because it is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. I also had a question. Um, I think one of my neighbors had mentioned that there was a pass that was available for senior citizens uh, for access, free access to the state parks in Connecticut. And I wondered if that was true. Yep. Uh, both those, yeah, Harkness is, is certainly a, a beautiful facility, but it really is two different facilities. There is the, uh, the mansion and support buildings of the, uh, the, the Harkness family. Uh, it was donated to the state in 1952, I believe. Um, but really with a couple of different purposes as a public park, but also to carve off a significant portion of the waterfront property um, for, for programs that are um, you know, ultimately for disabled folks uh, over there. So it really has two very distinct but robust uses to, uh, to serve the public. It was really a, an amazing gift uh, uh, to, to the state, but for, for very different purposes. Um, on the, the, the passes for senior citizens, yes, there are, uh, uh, we call them Charter Oak Passes. They are available for people who are 65 or older. Um, you can either call us or hit our website and get information on, on how to obtain those. One easy way is uh, next time you're going to certainly one of our, any of our major facilities, the Gillette Castles, the Hammond Assets, the Rocky Necks of the World, you can just roll in with your Connecticut driver's license showing that you're at least 65 and they'll hand you one right there. And that Perfect. covers, for, that covers uh, parking and admission fees um, at any of our state parks that charge a fee. So if we're going to Sherwood Island with a carload of people, does that mean we need to have the 65-year-old person as as driving? Can, <laughs> the 65-year-old does not need to be driving, but they need to be in the car. OK, <laughs> great. That's good to know. Yes, sir. Uh, the panel's talked on this, uh, mentioning the, nat the uh, natural wilderness of reserve. But I'm wondering if you might say a little bit more about the preservation component uh, in the development of the national park system of the state park system. If we turn to the national parks, for example, a battle raged from the 1890s mm -hmm. you know, through the 20th century between preservationists, those who created the Sierra Club, mm -hmm. um, and those who uh, wanted to uh, make uh, na natural areas um, uh, open for the public to visit. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, much, how strong a role did the preservationists pay, play in the state park system? Um, certainly, certainly a major component, but, but also in state parks, but also in uh, the, the work of the, uh, the State Forest Commission, which was kind of on a, on a dual track, um, as well as obviously the early work of, of the, the Forest and Park Association that, uh, that we've referenced. Um, certainly all of those factions, uh, and, and I would say more uh, from the forestry side, uh, certainly the, the preservation was, a, was maybe a stronger component of it. The, the early, certainly the early park system was primarily focused on creating outdoor recreation opportunities for people, uh, but, and then ultimately those, those two entities merged. Uh, but certainly that, uh, the, the preservation aspect, both in kind of the, the ethic of all the conversations that were happening around the creation of uh, national parks and, and state parks, that was certainly an important driver of the conversation as well. I'm on the ecology committee in, for the for, uh, City of Hartford Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. And so this whole thing about where, the recreation versus the, I'm a birds and butterfly person. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, I'm really learning that the athletic groups are very key constituents and they need to have a place as well and trying to figure out how do the, the recreational components fit into 
the landscapes and these amazing historic landscapes that we have as our city parks, the core of our city parks, how can we preserve the ecological, just the tree, uh, the, the genetics of our trees are probably some of the best genetics, really, you know, because you have to figure, uh, you know, Keeney Park was created in 1894, and so the value of just the genetics of the trees, like, that's so amazing, and yet it's very hard to get people excited about that. They want a football field, they, they don't, you know, do, you know, they're looking for a place to put aster, you know, it's synthetic turf, off the park land, you know, and, and, and even, uh, so, so, this is the core debate. It doesn't go away. I don't think it's ever going to go away. And especially as we enter the 21st century, we have a huge ecological challenges to meet. And this is where the relationship between uh, municipal, uh, state, and, and the National Wildlife Refuge becomes core, but also circling back to the friends groups. That the friends groups are really instrumental, not only in our state parks, but in our in our local parks as well. Gene, I, uh, we just have a couple of more minutes and I wanted to let you have uh, one more comment on, you know, will that tension continue into the next century of the parks? Do you see that as our um, society in Connecticut develops around nature, does that whole debate still go on? Well, I think you, you actually uh, raise a question about wh whether uh, the development of society will continue to re revolve around nature. I mean, if anything, uh, it's likely that social development will withdraw further from nature uh, into, into, into uh, private spaces equipped with electronics. Mm. Uh, but uh, I, I, many, uh, several of the recent comments, particularly the question about preservation, reminds me of the fact that uh, state parks and parks in general really represent a, a, an effort to put together, this is, this is the big picture, the real big picture. They represent an effort to put together two of the greatest things about America, not just Connecticut, but about America. One is the continent, this incredible stretch of nature, probably the most gifted landscape in the world, uh, the United States. Put that together with democracy, uh, with, with self-government. In other words, uh, how, how do you reconcile uh, the fact of uh, uh, everyone having a right to this property with, with preserving the property and proper, properly conserving the property. And I would suggest that both democracy and uh, uh, nature uh, have often been, been seen as attacked by industrialization. Uh, and parks uh, are, are regarded as a, uh, have been developed as a way to defend both democracy and nature against the encroachments of industrialization, which has a tendency to uh, cover over things with, with asphalt. Uh, uh, think of the Joni Mitchell uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, song about the parking lot, uh, but also has a tendency to mechanize human beings, mm -hmm. which is what people like Olmsted uh, thought about in the 19th century. Uh, again, I'll mention Olmsted. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm clutching this, this sacred text this is a printout of a, uh, an encyclopedia article by Olmsted in 1879 uh, uh, under the, on the subject of park. Uh, it is a beautiful thing. I've only just discovered it in a preparation for, for this little session. Uh, but Olmsted from Hartford, uh, who designs many things in Hartford, uh, is already wrestling with all of these questions, particularly how to reconcile public access with preservation of nature uh, in such a way as to keep nature inspirational for the public, the park as a kind of a civic resource that will make people better citizens. Uh, and the rap against amusement parks is that they're regarded as things that will make people worse citizens. Uh, they're places where people drink and, and, uh, and uh, you know, kind of fire off uh, emotional rockets. Uh, and uh, also, they're, they're almost industrial places. Mm -hmm. They're crowded, they're filled with mechanical rides, this is just like industry. Mm -hmm. This is not a contrast to industry. This is industry. Industrialized amusements. Parks are supposed to be the opposite of that. Tom, I don't know how you're going to top that, but I'm going to let you have the last word. Democracy and the terrific. continent. That was, that was terrific. But, yeah. but just getting back to the point, and I, and I think it does uh, maybe highlight in a, in a small vignette that, that tension, and there certainly, there certainly is 
Um, and but I think I think one one great example of of trying to manage that in the presence is is Ham and Acid Beach State Park. Um, we have almost two million annual visitors at Ham and Acid Beach State Park. It is one of the state's largest tourist attractions. Um, as Dan was indicating, on July 4th, we had a record crowds down there, probably 20 or 30 percent more people than we'd ever had in a single day down there. Um, it, it is an important recreation opportunity. There is a campground there that I believe is the second largest campground in the, in the country. Um, it is a tremendous recreation opportunity for people. But it is also, um, for instance, one of the most important birding areas in North America. Uh, people come from across the state and across the region uh, to bird at Hammond Asset. Um, it is just a, a tremendous uh, resource because also of the way that it's managed. It, it's, it's tough to do some days. Uh, there's an awful lot of tension between uh, those two things, and, and certainly we get it wrong sometimes. But uh, there, is, there is that opportunity uh, to, provide, uh, to provide that recreation opportunity, but also uh, provide, the, uh, provide the, the natural resources for, for, both for folks to enjoy, but also to, uh, to support the, the natural environment. Tom, I think you have a great job. Thank you all three for joining us. And thank you for being with us, too. Thank you so much, everybody. That was a great discussion that really, I think, was the perfect thing for the Old State House mission, which is to bring civics together with history. That was on target, so thank you. And please remember to pick up a copy of, of Connecticut Explored. It's a great magazine, and you won't want to miss it. Thanks for coming. <laughs>